Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from the African continent or anywhere around the world. Welcome to this launch event of Postcolonialism's Today special issue, Lessons to Africa from Africa, Reclaiming Early Post-Independence uh, Progressive Policies. It was published in Cadestria's African Development Journal in 2022. My name is Heba Khalil. I'm an assistant professor of sociology and have been a member of the working group of postcolonialisms today since its launch a few years ago. Let me and my colleague Aishu start off by introducing postcolonialisms today and this launch event and then pass on to our colleague Tete to introduce the publication and today's uh, speakers. Postcolonialisms Today is a policy, research, and advocacy uh, project that seeks to unearth development thinking and initiatives across the African continent, particularly within the immediate post-independence period. The project departs from an understanding of the current situation of the African continent as one that parallels that of colonized Africa. It's a situation of neoliberal domination, economic dependence, a situation that begs for uh, alternative models of thinking, of development, of policymaking. Um, it's a situation that finds us within a neoliberal framework that presents itself as the only option, as a natural order of sense uh, of things and as the common sense um, of economy and society. Therefore, this project is particularly focused on recovering policies that sought to challenge colonial domination and exercise the social, economic, and cultural um, sovereignty uh, on the continent. The special issue we present to you today, Lessons to Africa from Africa, is part of this effort to unearth the valuable policies and thinking of this post-independence period and the lessons for contemporary movements of sovereignty and economic and social justice. The special issue is one important moment of this effort that has been ongoing for three years now. When my friend Tete, who I will be presenting next, talked to me about the idea of post-colonialisms today, I immediately understood the gap that this project would be filling. As an activist from North Africa myself, I was fed a simple narrative of the failure of post-independence governments, the failure of the Nasser regime, and the necessity of global neoliberalism and open-door policies and such. Why did I not hear an alternative narrative of an older generation? Why were the tides of neoliberalism and Western narratives so strong that they were completely, that they have completely erased any voices that we had from the period? I did not hesitate to be part of postcolonialisms today in an effort to dig deep and unearth those narratives, voices, policies, thinking uh, from the continent and join forces with a community of like-minded intellectuals, activists, and practitioners to unthink the neoliberal, not common senseness, but nonsenseness of this moment. Um, to challenge a powerful hegemony like that of neoliberal thinking, uh, we need a group effort, which in and, of, in and of itself requires challenging the individualism of much of research done around the world, both within and outside of academic institutions. Therefore, postcolonialisms today was not merely interested in funding individual researchers even around the continent and you know, letting them go and do their own research alone. Far from this, we were invested in building a community that crosses national borders, language barriers, different backgrounds, and even different generations. This long-term community building effort involved collective conceptualizations of important and yet simple ideas like development, sovereignty, economic transformation. It produced intergenerational conversations and exchanges on the continent, and it created space for certain types of exchanges and conversations that were largely not taking place in universities or policy spaces or elsewhere. In doing so, we sought to unearth something that has been hidden for very long. Here, I would like to introduce my colleague Aishu Balaji from Regions Refocus, the Secretariat of Postcolonialisms Today, who will highlight some of the events that made this special issue possible. Thank you so much, Heba. Um, I'm happy to briefly outline some of what went into bringing the special issue to life. Uh, as you said, the collection is the result of a deeply collective process involving um, the working group, an advisory group, a secretariat, and, um, and of course the researchers. And it's also part of an ongoing agenda of advocacy and building community rather than just the end point of this process. 
Uh, so post-colonialisms today was conceptualized by a group of allies who met on the margins of three regional and global policy meetings in Addis Ababa, Rabat, uh, Santiago and New York between 2017 and 2018. In 2018, the project put out an open call for proposals in four languages, which saw over 90 submissions from every region of Africa. After the working group selected 11 researchers, keeping in mind things like gender and regional balance, and including voices beyond just academia, we all came together at Codestria's headquarters in Dakar in April 2018 to refine the proposals and solidify a common intellectual framework for the publication. Over the next year, the researchers undertook archival work and produced four drafts each, which were reviewed and edited by the working group and the secretariat. PCT then convened a collective peer review process in the form of an intergenerational meeting in Dar es Salaam in March 2019. Um, at this meeting, the researchers were able to present their articles to a group of elders who had actively shaped progressive policy in the early post-independence era as activists and as members of government, including um, just giants like Akilak Basoyer and Isa Shivji. While Codestria put the collection through their own rigorous peer review process, a group of working group and secretariat members and advisors came together in Accra in January 2020 to map an introduction that would frame these incredible articles and articulate the conceptual underpinnings of the project. And now here we are. Um, it's been a very rich four years and it's a real joy to see the collection out in the world. Uh, Regions Refocus has, has just been very proud to serve as Secretariat and help coordinate these efforts alongside the rest of the project community and, and we're so excited to see what the future holds. Thanks so much, Heba. Thank you, Aishu. And now I'm happy to introduce Tete Hormeko Ajay, the Head of Programs at the Third World Network Africa and a member of the Working Group of Postcolonialisms today. Thank you very much, Heba. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, let me start these few remarks by saying that the essential premise of the post colonialism Today project, as well as the papers that are now collected together in this special publication of the Codestral Journal, African Development. But the argument is that the policies adopted and promoted by African governments in the immediate post colonial period, um, that is until the 1980s when they were abandoned, by the structural adjustment policies of deregulation and liberalization. That those policies are of critical relevance and positive insights to the challenges that African countries face today. And in fact, um, those challenges will benefit immensely by recapturing those insights and reformating them for our, our, our times. Now, this premise and argument is fully elaborated in the introductory chapter that prefaces the collection of papers. And in these remarks, I'll try and elaborate the main elements of that, of that argument. The, there are essentially three broad aspects of the argument. The first is that those post-independence policies did actually achieve better outcomes for Africa's people and African countries. Better outcomes in terms of economic development, domestic accumulation, and domestic capacity building, better outcomes in terms of social policy and social provisioning and social recovery by people, better outcomes in terms of the overall sense of social cohesion and national development and national pride, and better outcomes above all for the sense of African people that they are in, they are, they are in control of their destiny, charting their way to chart their path in the, in the global world at that time. Now, the second one is that those policies themselves, in addition to the better outcomes, were pursued in response to the specific and peculiar challenges that Africa's leaders and people found themselves facing after independence. So they were in response to challenges that people felt they had to respond to. And whatever the ideological formulation that people came with it, <clears throat> they were in response to practical challenges, they're not simply ideological pursuits. And the final one is that this is a time when these policies were being pursued by a people who, as a result of the struggle for independence, were together, shared a national purpose, uh, a national mission, a certain collective agency 
no matter the disagreement between leaders and people, the disagreement between different forms of leaders, they have a common agenda to reshape Africa's place in the world. I think that these three elements make those policies that we're pursuing quite interesting, especially when we compare it today. Now, it best point in though that this return to the immediate post-colonial period and these policies is not simply a love of history. It is more importantly because we are today confronting challenges and crises in Africa. And in terms of crisis, it's important, as they say, to have to find out, as they say, if you don't know where the rain beats you, you don't know where you start getting dry. As to, as to be put this in the Igbo program. It's important to return to that. Um, and we are return, to return to that, we have to remind ourselves a bit more, if you don't mind, of where we are, really. So let me just, just take a few minutes to make broad strokes of what we are facing. As we all know, long before COVID intervened in Africa in the past 20 years, African countries were not in the best place anyway. Um, almost 40 years of new liberal policies had developed a situation where African countries were still relying on good commodity prices for income and revenue for their development. Therefore, every little fluctuation in broader commodity prices sent them into problems, accumulating debts. Um, in spite of all those rising commodity prices, there was very little domestic manufacturing capacity being built. In fact, the basis for those commodity dependence and general commodity prices was the fact that domestic capacity manufacturing was destroyed. It began to depend on import. So we had an economy where even where we are getting good revenue for international trade was stagnating anyway. Um, we have jobless growth, uh, unemployment. And what it meant was that actually the various sectors of the economy were not performing. There was rural stagnation, for instance, which meant that rural people faced with a grim prospect of no development and losing income were just running away from the rural sector, seeking livelihood in the cities. Cities have said that we're not creating or expanding jobs. And when they couldn't find jobs in the cities or anywhere, they migrated and tried to find you know, the ravages of migration to Europe and things like that. And then in spite of all that collapse of economy and lack of development, of course, the elites in Africa and their partners in the global world were accumulating wealth and taking all the little of the resources that was being generated. So you have massive and, and, and escalating inequality. Now, some of these problems that I'm talking about were exacerbated as a result of neoliberal policies. But whatever they were, whether directly or indirectly, they reflected the structural problems and limitations that African countries are inherited from independence. So that in fact, if people like Kwame Nkrumah and Nyerere and co emerged today, they say, but hold on, hang on just a minute. Wasn't it a problem that we were trying to resolve 20 years ago? And what has happened? The difference is that while at the time of Nyerere and Kuma, they saw those structural problems as the object of economic development that might be addressed as a challenge. In our times, during the liberal times, those challenges were put aside at best as something that would be resolved as a result of strict adherence to good economic performance, to liberal policies, letting the market decide. And that really is the essential difference between development thinking and development policy thinking and policy making in the immediate post career period which you should not pay attention to. Because the truth of the matter is that when Nkrumah and Nyerere and Kaunda and, and Jombo Kenyatta and Senghor and Nasa, all of them, what they confronted at independence was a kind of economic and structure that they inherited from the colonial times. Small economies, internally fragmented, externally dominated, poverty, with very little resources, all the resources that were generated in their economies were carted away. Those kind of economies were internally imbalanced, not coherent, and externally dominated. So to address that problem, they had to do two things. First of all, ensure that they re-established the national control and determination over their own resources and economies to win economic independence for themselves. But equally importantly, to generate internal coherence to bring together the fragmented parts of society that were fragmented by colonialism to make a national whole, a coherent whole. So for them, for a start, the notion of economic development, in fact, not simply economic development, social development was inextricably linked with all manner of different parts of social, society and development. It was nothing like focusing on the economy and GDP growth, no. So it was to say, bringing three things together, First of all, how do you build an internal economy and its capacity to produce for itself <clears throat> and be independent? Second, how do you build coherence among 
uh, different part of the like of the ethnic groups, nationalities of the got together with their different tensions. And how do you at the same time achieve equity, inclusion, and balance? This combination of things that address developmental policy led men that many initiatives were put in different places that today, when we look at it, we may laugh, or even those times were being condemned that doesn't make economic sense. So when we are constructing a factory, for instance, we may put a factory far away from the capital city because we think that a factory somewhere in the right area is also useful to be able to give a sense, all a sense of their ownership, of their development. And in fact, that sense of ownership and inclusion was most important in the area of social policy, where people felt that education, good water, uh, roads, and health are some of the benefits which were denied from the colonialism which has been brought. This sense of inclusive development and nation building in equity development was the logic of development, which I think was expressed in four broad areas that I'd like to detail now. The first of these was the insistence on investment in the rural economy, investment in agricultural modernization and economic diversification. And this makes sense. So African countries then and even now the majority of the people made their home and livelihoods in agriculture, the rural economy. And therefore, if you are going to try and generate domestic resources to improve people, you have to improve agriculture, which is the majority economy, but also more importantly, which was the means of livelihood, the majority of people there. Of course, contrary to what you may hear, that many African countries in those things abandoned or ignored the rural sector. Actually, they were very, very clear and paid attention to it. You remember the whole philosophy of Ojamaa about it. I have many, many things about it. Kwame Nkrumah, for instance, uh, took it forward in his Africa development plan, which is in one of our studies, which I've elaborated, which shows a certain need of relationship between what happened in the rural sector, what happened in the rural sector. So to do that, to, to, to invest in the rural economy and improve this modernization as a contribution to the diversification, they pursued a number of policies. In the economic area, for instance, there were input, input subsidies that were given to rural farmers, extension services, um, price stabilization mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. But not simply in the, in the economic sector. There were rural infrastructure, uh, things that were important for rural people to live together, post offices that were put in rural remote towns. But more importantly, also the question of the rural, the, the well being of rural people, health especially. And they took a totalistic view of this idea of health for rural people. To give an example, when I was growing up, when uh, people were dealing with the issue of malaria, you had local health officials going to the market where people were trading, examining their living condition try to get them to live such a way that the idea of malaria and mosquito breeding grounds were eliminated, things like that. If people come to your house to make sure that your pot where your drinking water is stored properly and the government invested in that kind of service. Today, when I talk about malaria and all these services have been moved away and all you see is some NGO got in money from some foreign donor supplying mosquito nets which have been permitted with insecticides. Uh, as the main malaria fighting mechanism, which most people treat with contempt in the least dying off. So this is idea of invest in rural area to make them contribute to economic development is an important thing. Which takes us to the second important intervention, which is industrialization. As you know, industrialization was treated as an important mechanism of building domestic capacity, but also bringing the African economy into the modern era. Because even though African countries have skills and capacity to produce, those skills and capacity to produce were destroyed in the colonial time when all the economic resources were destroyed so that they can use their resources to as raw materials to feed industrialization from Europe. So African countries needed to recompose what they had or recompose their modern for, for, for the society at that time. Of course, unlike their counterparts in, uh, in, in Asia, where Japanese colonialism only left something to build on. Europeans in Africa completely destroy everything, so we have to start from scratch. So all the idea of building on um, import substitution industry, et cetera, et cetera, had to take cognizance of that starting point. And in that area, in that, in, in that context, the role of the state, both as an initiator, as a catalyst, as a provider, was an important element in that. Of course, there are many you know, things that can be, can be corrected, but it's essential to understand that that was the context where industrialization policy was being pursued. And they led it. Today, of course, we have a different approach to establishing that. 
whatever the difficulties were, they build industrial capacity in many areas, in different factories. Uh, the third area um, is the idea is in the so social, social policy, which we have talked about already. Social policy now, not simply in education, health, water provision, uh, that I've talked about, which is thought as an important element to be so that industrialization and equal development needs uh, health people, but health people themselves are an end in industrial development. Let's take health, for instance. It's not, health was comprehensively provided. It's not primary health clinics were built, important modern health facilities. So big hospitals were built, teaching hospitals, research hospitals. But it was impressive to know, it didn't stop there. They were interested in building health capacity that will help them address the modern challenges. So almost all the African countries that I've read about from Kenya to Zambia, Tanzania to Ghana, and even Zimbabwe later on, invested in building domestic pharmaceutical capacity to be able to make medicines. And given where we are today, that we have a situation where we are not able to even uh, get our own vaccines and we are facing vaccine apartheid and imperialism, it's important to bear this lesson in mind. Now, the investment in pharmaceutical capacity represents one area in which African countries were prepared to go to the cutting edge of knowledge. And that idea of building knowledge takes us to the fourth and final area where African countries are very important. Build knowledge, build culture, build African pride. Building knowledge took two parts. It was to build knowledge so that African countries can be provide uh, uh, for their own challenges and meet their needs, to be part of the global development. Um, but more importantly, they're not simply sitting there to just build at the basics of knowledge. They also wanted to be at the cutting edge. So when Kwame Nkrumah, for instance, established the Ghana Atomic Reactor and established the Ghana Nuclear Commission, he was very clear that nuclear study was not for, you know, it's not for Ghana to join the nuclear uh, weaponry clubs, but to be at the cutting edge of the multifaceted levels of research and knowledge that allow countries to be at the global level. So that was important part of knowledge. Uh, they invested that, that knowledge in all manner of areas. And, and in the, because of lack of time, I cannot give a lot of detail. But it was also knowledge that was supposed to enable Africans to reinvent themselves and reassert themselves as they were before they were devastated by colonialism and colonial degradation, for instance. To know that they are their own people. To be able to bring their knowledge of the past is a modern, to defend it and put it forward. So that knowledge is not simply in science, it's not simply in production, not in industry, but it's also in art, in culture, in music, to use the Ghanaian, sorry, the African culture at that time, bring it forward and make it a contribution. So if you look at it, it's a totality of areas that African leaders were invested in as an important contribution or as making the challenge of development, where progressive policy were made across the board. In listing all these policies, post colonizing today and the research after is not suggesting at all that the policies were panaceas or they were perfect, not. In fact, part of PCT is to actually criticize them. We do know, even at that time, the limitations of, of class, of gender, and everything that you know, limited the reach and the potential of those policies. Our point, however, is that these were policies formulated in response to specific questions. The fundamental question about what do you do to society? How do you recompose a society which has been devastated for four years, 400 years of colonialism, which have been torn apart? How do, they, how do they find themselves together so that they assert their, 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 their agency over themselves in the global world? That fundamental question remains. It remains today as an economic question. It remains today as a political question. It remains today as an ideological question. And it's the exploration of this question that we try to address attention the early post colonial policies, and which have been explored in different areas in the papers that follow. Thank you very much. And now let me introduce Jimmy Adesina, Professor in Social Policy at the College of Graduate Studies, University of South Africa. As a researcher for post colonialisms today, he focused on the variations of post colonial imaginations and ideologies on the continent. Good day, everybody. Uh, my presentation today um, revolves around the idea of variations in post-colonial uh, imagination. Um, and I uh, do this by reflecting on the uh, 
thought and statecraft of uh, Senghor, uh, Julius Nyerere, and, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who are arguably uh, Africa's three, three of Africa's most cerebral post-colonial uh, intellectual presidents. Uh, the contribution to the post-colonialism today project itself um, is inspired by or, or driven by my ten my 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 increasing uh, what do you call it disquiet with the tendency to flatten African leadership landscape, especially the nationalist project. And I organize my reflections uh, uh, around five uh, themes. <laughs> Uh, the idea of socialism, pan-Africanism, nation building project, economic development and epistemic decolonization as one could descend from their thoughts uh, and, 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 and writings. Um, and then I end by drawing lessons from what I call contemporary uh, pan-African project. Um, in, in, in regard to the to, to this socialist uh, uh, imagination, uh, Senghor's uh, idea of African socialism is, is, is grounded in the different stages of development of the idea of negritude, but in its original conception. And it's rooted within the, also, rooted, also rooted within the French socialist tradition uh, in the spirit of Henri uh, de Saint-Simon. Um, for Senghor, and Negritude offers the what I call the African marker on Senghorian social, socialism, um, where he contrasts what he calls African sens sensate conviviality uh, uh, against uh, what he called Hellenic, what he called reasoning eye. Uh, Senghor rejects uh, scientific socialism uh, because of what he calls his ne neglect of cultural and, 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 and the spiritual. But the older Senghor will pivot towards hybridity uh, uh, with emphasis on, on uh, universal civilization or the symbiosis of different civilizations. Uh, Yere's idea of African socialism, however, is more concretely derived from the norms of what I call solidarity, generosity, and care in the context of his, uh, his upbringing. Uh, this is a context grounded in the norms of mutuality, generosity, labor, uh, in the sense that everybody who can work should work and the collective ownership of primary means of production, which is land. Um, <clears throat> in reference to what they call it, in relation to Senghor, Yerere also will reject scientific socialism for different reasons, more for uh, Marx and socialist emphasis on, on the uh, centrality of, of, of class struggle and class, class conflict in, in, in Marx and thoughts. Um, uh, uh, Nkrumah's take on socialist, um, socialism will involve an early conception that is anchored on what he called the restoration of African humanist and egalitarian principles of society, which continues to serve as the underlining uh, presuppositions of his, of his conception of socialism. But he will pivot later from about 63, 64 uh, to full embrace of, of scientific socialism. Um, Nkrumah will argue that what Africans, what, what socialist thought in Africa must retrieve is the spirit of communalism and humanism uh, and, and its reconciliation of individual advancement with group welfare. He will reject the, the especially the Sangorian notion of African socialism, which he will claim is more associated with anthropology than with political economy. Uh, and, and, and argue that there is actually no historical or even anthropological evidence for a, what they call a faster simplification of pre-colonial Africa uh, in, uh, that, that he, he, he argued could be designed in Senghorian thought. Um, but Nkrumah will share affinity with Yere's idea that norms of mutuality and care uh, which shaped <coughs> pre-colonial African societies will be central in socialist imagination in the post-colonial, uh, socialist construction in the post-colonial period. Uh, in terms of, you know, the, the variations of the Pan-African vision, uh, one could argue that Senghorian's Pan-African vision is more cultural and aesthetic than political. Uh, Nkrumah, on the other hand, is of course, uh, on, you know, widely known as the 
you know, what do you call a leading advocate of African political union uh, in, in the near term. In this sense, Yerere will be argued to, to uh, inhabit a midway house, you know, uh, initially, especially at the Cairo conference in 1963, skeptical of, of uh, uh, Nkrumah's uh, uh, idea of political union. Uh, with pre preference for, for, you know, first pursuing regional unity in the context of East Africa. But with the um, overthrow of Nkrumah, for instance, uh, Yere will in, in inherit the mantle of becoming the lead advocate for African unity uh, up to the point of his death. <laughs> uh, in terms of the construction of post-colonial nation state or nationhood, uh, all the three, all, all, all the three you know, uh, uh, people that were looking at, you know, individuals that were looking at, for instance, strong, shared a very strong commitment to the construction of trans-ethnic uh, religious national identity, what one may call <clears throat> nation building uh, uh, projects, you know. Uh, and for, for St. Gaul, uh, he will argue that independence and nation building require first a, a, along with self-determination, freedom of choice. Uh, there's a commitment to transcending colonial ethnicization of identity and politics among all the three. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 Yerere and Senghor will be particularly quite uh, uh, um, uh, successful in creating modes of transcending political uh, 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 post-colonial uh, politics in, in their different countries. Um, Nkrumah and Yere shared a strong commitment to the construction of nation building, national sovereign project, mm -hmm. building, constructing national, national sovereign project, and the right to choose one's friends, you know, and, and, and the linking of national to Pan African identity. Uh, Senghor would be particularly, you know, what do you call it, uh, 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 Loki, in, in being, you know, in the context, uh, especially considering that. He was, uh, you know, from a minor ethnic group, um, you know, the Sere and, and a minority religion, you know, Catholic in a predominantly Wolof and predominantly Muslim community, uh, to have had the good fortune of the tolerance of the Islamic brotherhoods in Senegal. Uh, Nkrumah was less lucky, uh, having to confront the vociferous hyper-ethnic and regionalist opposition who are not shy to use, you know, violence uh, is assassination attempt, you know, uh, 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 you know, and 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 and, and uh, uh, plot, 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 play, you know, plotting coups, and so on and so forth. And as Mahmoud Mamdani will argue, Yerere Tanzania will turn out to be Africa's probably, arguably, most successful nation building project, especially in mainland Tanzania. And and here, you know, um, in Yerere Tanzania, we had an extensive use of of social policy instruments uh, for, the, for the nation building project. Uh, in terms of variations in their post, in their economic uh, development imagination, uh, this is where the strong divergence becomes quite noticeable. Uh, Senghor will, <clears throat> you know, with, will, will, will persist with an inherited colonial uh, e economy. Uh, although with, with significant investment, but relatively, you know, uh, low growth rates, you know. Um, Yerere, on the other hand, who had a strong commitment to rural development on the grounds that this is where, you know, most Tanzania rural areas where most Tanzania live, and, and, and it will be area where they will find their material well-being and their satisfaction, and therefore they need to focus on, 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 on rural development. Uh, Nkrumah, on the other hand, was, was one of the most strident and ardent, you know, uh, what advocates of industrialization uh, uh, as the linchpin for economic development and freedom, um, with massive investment in infrastructure, uh, industrial complex, in uh, you know research and in, 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 in uh, innovation uh, in, uh, infrastructure and so on and so forth, and all the three. Uh, yeah, and more strongly with Nkrumah and Yerere, a uh, strong commitment to the idea of, of uh, what a better life or through extensive uh, uh, social uh, investment. And I'll come to uh, the issue of, of uh, you know, the epistemic dimension of post-colonialism. And in the face of what is called the prevalent uh, decolonial, African decolonial literature to argue that 
especially using the uh, Nkrumah's injunction that uh, seeking first political kingdom meant uh, a neglect of, the, of, 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 of epistemic decolonization and, 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 and constructing a new post-colonial uh, you know, epistemic identity. You know. uh, and I'll try to reading of Senghor's negritude, you know, offered by Suleiman Bashir Diani, for instance, as epistemology it emphasizes that that uh, his take on on you know African senses, um, you know, uh, 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 ontological, you know, Christian sense making, uh, was was a, a direct challenge to the Cartesian binary opposition of the subject and and an object, and this is something that Senghor carried on. Uh, through all. Uh, Yerere's, you know, sense making is, is firmly grounded in, in what we call the African ontological condition, especially of his, of his rural homestead, uh, with a strong advocacy, uh, advocacy for complete overhaul of contents of curriculum and pedagogic approaches, uh, especially most obvious in his, 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 his book, you know, uh, Education for Several Lands. Uh, Nkrumah's strident commitment to epistemic decolonization is evident in at least three areas you know first is the africana project you know which was originally uh, 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 you know under the direction of wb du bois when he, he, he relocated to Ghana, he, he moved to ghana um, and, and was launched in 1962 um, and, and, and especially, you know, um, um, Nkrumah's speech at the inauguration of the Institute of African Studies at University of Ghana, Legon, which addressed the epistemic erasure at the heart of colonial projects and the establishment of struggling between political and epistemic freedom. And the mandate of the Institute was, in fact, to advance what he called, you know, what he called uh, 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 Africa centered. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, epistem and, and, and intellectual project. It's important to remember, of course, that is is most philosophical work, uh, conscientiousism. After all, carried the subtitle "Philosophy and Ideology for Decolonization." Uh, for all the three of them, for instance, the idea the idea of socialism is grounded in in, in African ontological uh, condition, at least as each understood it. Um, you know, so one of the lessons that you can learn, you know, for contemporary Pan-African project, I will emphasize five areas. One is the affirmation of an expansive uh, idea of Pan-Africanism, one that returns to the embracing of Africa and its diaspora in the, in the, in the Pan-African project. The reaffirmation of rebuilding of the Pan-African sovereign project, a value-based regional development conception uh, that is grounded in, in the notion of structural transformation and the advancement of human uh, well-being. And an embrace of Yerere's emphasis on unity. And as he noted at, the, at, at Ghana's 40th independence anniversary uh, address that he gave, um, the, the unity will not end our weakness, but until we unite, we cannot even begin to end uh, that weakness. And then the issue of the responsibility of the next generation, rather than seeking to destroy the legacy of the older generation, to take out the button where the older generation laid it down. This was a, an injunction that uh, uh, Walimu reminded us of, especially again at that uh, uh, 40th anniversary uh, of Ghana's independence. Now, of course, it will require that we addressed what I call the antinomies uh, in the nationalist project. That involves a commitment to deliberative governance and plurality, a commitment to gender equity and transformation of gender relations. But these are critical blind spots uh, in, within the, what I call the, 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 the thoughts of, of an, an statecraft of uh, uh, Leopold Sedas and Go. Um, Walimu, Julius Nyeri, and, and Kwame Nkrumah. I, I thank you all. And now we will hear from Kareem Anomar. Kareem Megahed is Economic Justice Programs Officer at Social Justice Platform Egypt. Omar Ghanem is Research Director at Social Justice Platform Egypt. As researchers for post-colonialisms today, they focused on post-independence industrial development and its imperial challenges within the context of Nasser's Egypt. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Almar. I'm Karim. 
Uh, and since we're addressing the topic of post-colonialism in Egypt, we of course had to address Nasser. Like I guess the best way of putting it is that Nasser is the, is like the omnipresent phenomena <laughs> that never dies basically. When it comes to Nasser and the, the building of this new state, like I think it would be fair to say that this would like was like transitional and it was a radical transition as well, like because the way he perceived, like the way that his regime perceived uh, uh, certain plans about moving forward, about implementing change, were completely radical in comparison to what, like, to the sort of plans that were being propagated before his rise to power. Uh, so, I think first to make sense of why Nasser becomes this uh, this towering figure in uh, in twentieth century history in Egypt is to see what was happening before him, what actually made made the industrialization program uh, that kind of refined Nasser's vision uh, for Egypt men. Uh, the Egyptian state in the early 20th century was suffering from a state of malaise, you could say. Uh, the, the state that was largely kind of constructed uh, during the Ismailite period uh, in the 19th century as a response to the debt crisis was to a large extent an extractive state uh, very much focused on extracting the value that's needed to service the debts and with, uh, with very little vision of what could be done. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, proposals that are being floated uh, radical proposals about uh, land reform, about electrifying the, uh, the Lo Aswan Dam uh, to provide the electricity for Egypt. So many proposals, but nothing really is being implemented. Uh, even World Bank uh, reports from that period reflect that. They speak of Egypt as virtually having no developmental vision. So uh, in a large sense, what actually differentiates Nasser from the period before him is that Nasser kind of becomes the first one in almost two generations to actually try to see what an Egyptian state could do. To actually try to build that state and see how it could transform Egypt. Nasser, much like a lot of Egyptians at that time, realized that if Egypt is to become an independent country, a sovereign country, a master of its own fate that's not occupied by the British, that means that the Egyptian economy itself has to change, that Egypt has to move from being just an exporter of raw material, uh, just living off uh, uh, of what you can call uh, of commodity exports largely, to uh, an industrial economy that's capable of generating the development and the industrial power that a modern state would need to assert its uh, uh, its sovereignty and its legitimacy internally to provide the public goods that become a hallmark of the modern state as it shifts into more of uh, welfare uh, capitalism in that uh, historical period. As such, the industrialization program kind of becomes the spine of that new state. All its policies roughly become developed as auxiliaries of that goal. Nasser's attempt to kind of create that alliance with the national bourgeoisie fails and falters very quickly. He pretty quickly realizes that they are not going to be on board for the kind of investment. Uh, they are incapable and uh, probably not really incentivized to carry out that project. As such, the state actually alters its outlook completely on the industrialization process, uh, decides that nationalizations are going to happen, the economic organization is going to be established, the state is going to manage directly industrial production at a greater capacity, it's going to intervene more in the economy to carry out that project of industrialization. As such, most policies formulated uh, during that time, uh, whether economic, 
uh, policies, uh, be them financial or agricultural or industrial, they are kind of built around making that transformation in the Egyptian uh, uh, mode of production, if you will. Uh, that, of course, necess state building uh, is not just an institution building, it's not actually it's just cons uh, uh, constructing physical spaces in factories and homes, it's also uh, an ideological uh, project fundamentally. Definitely. When the industrialization process and plans uh, start, they are indeed incredibly amb ambitious plans. You're talking about the, in, virtually more than doubling the Egyptian industrial capacity. That's a massive undertaking. So the first industrial plan for Egypt, the, the plan sought to both expand the heavy industry sector, the consumer goods sector, and the armament sector, all at the same time, a country that had a marginal industrial sector up until five years before that. As we did, as we said in the paper, like uh, we went back to this uh, sort of intellectual journal that was issued in Egypt under the name Talia or the Vanguard in English, and it was basically a group of Marxists who, to a large extent, uh, worked with Nasser or at least supported his vision. They were intellectuals, uh, scholars, and activists as well. And like we felt that there was this consensus that, yeah, as much as they supported this program and as much as they supported the, pl the plan, they identified, identified one main point which needs to, like, which we need, which we need to reflect on, like, which is that the emphasis within the plan on the uh, consumer and uh, in uh, consumers industries vis-a-vis -vis the uh, heavy industries, like. Uh, because like the first five year plan focused on the like on, on this uh, non heavy industries and like these scholars or intellectuals said that if we are actually to, like if we actually want to move beyond where we are and we actually actually want to see like the the end results we should we should start shifting our emphasis or our focus on more towards like investing in heavy industries. And we felt that, like this, like Nasser didn't actually manage to do, not only because of the defeat, like that that, that he uh, that he had to deal with in 1967, but there were also a, a lot, uh, like um, another, like a group of other factors within the system itself that prevented this sort of transformation. Like there were a lot of problems uh, with bureaucracy. There were a lot of problems with plan with like uh, plans or visions that were basically like how to say it like um, pushed aside as part of our attempt to deconstruct this general context in which this experiment was born we tried to look at what we considered misconception surrounding the experiment itself this includes the categorization or the labeling of the experiment as a socialist experiment that dependent uh, that depended on uh, on socialist planning or central planning in our understanding, this was not the case at all. On the contrary, like the Nasserite regime certainly borrowed certain elements from the socialist way of thinking, but it did not actually develop a, a fully socialist or central planning. A proper way of describing what Nasser did is like developmental planning and not central planning. The regime did not actually outlaw like the private sector. It did not prevent the private sector from uh, actually working within the, the national economy. Actually, within the industrial sector specifically, we see that while the, the large uh, industrial uh, establishment in Egypt were almost completely dominated by uh, state enterprises, almost 90% of them, uh, about, uh, in, for the entire industrial economy, state control only manifested in around 60%. So there was a significantly large and vibrant private sector but mostly it was restricted to the uh, small and medium establishments that mainly worked to supply the large uh, industrial establishments uh, that the regime establishes, like employing tens of thousands of workers uh, in heavy industry or consumer goods. Another important aspect uh, about the Nasserite experience is the way it dealt with 
with the uh, with with the working women, like how the how the regime sought to integrate them into its industrialization program against the like the patriarchal norms that that existed back then in Egypt. In, interest, interestingly, we don't think that the regime actually fought patriarchy as much as it like thought to integrate these women without antagonizing those who thought that. Th th those who thought or saw that like women should not actually work so the regime actually pushed like like this idea of having working women present in a number of factories all over the country yet it did so within very specific limits that that did not antagonize those with patriarchal views actually some of the limits established during that period where women were formally given the right to work uh, 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 f fully given that right some of these uh, uh, restrictions such as women not working uh, specifically in certain entertainment uh, uh, places uh, or working at night shifts some of these actually still continue up until now they have not been changed this is uh, the gains of women in the working place has <laughs> largely stagnated since then it fell short from introducing like full emancipation or giving women workers like the right to be or, or in equal terms with their male counterparts because like these norms persisted. Uh, that national uh, anti-colonial experiment uh, meant that the experiment was always always felt right, really under siege and that w could easily be justified. Egypt was invaded more than once by different countries, uh, often for incredibly flimsy reasons. Uh, and that kind of meant that the industrialization project itself had to be shaped around these, uh, around the, the, the imperial reaction to the anti-colonial uh, 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 movement that's taking hold in Egypt. Uh, and that meant that questions over how the industrialization program itself is directed, whether it should focus on the heavy industry that Egypt needs on the long term to sustain the project itself, to sustain itself independent on uh, independent of uh, uh, center centers of imperial power in Europe and in the U.S., or should it focus on the consumer goods that were necessary to improve the quality of life for the average Egyptian? Uh, allowed for uh, the state to accrue the capital that it needs to actually finance the, uh, the heavy industries project uh, meant that the state had a very uh, difficult situation and faced very real external uh, limitations on the industrialization program that it was trying to implement. Uh, eventually, the state actually, the state largely tried to pursue both at the same time at the end consumer goods with more success because these are easier than capital goods uh, uh, to manufacture in uh, passable or quality for consumption Nasser does not succeed in democratizing political control over that new state uh, he certainly attempts uh, things like uh, uh, establishing the Youth League of the Arab Socialist Union, uh, the magazine itself, al uh, There is that realization that social and political cadres need to be built up to protect the system in the future. However, the system does not succeed in that, mainly, uh, I would say, because the experiment was far too short. Uh, and the, on the other hand, the system itself was not built to have that higher level of democratic input, which means that when policies regarding industrialization and the social gains that accompanying it, that accompanied it, such as the doubling of the minimum wage or uh, uh, macroeconomic gains such as uh, improved uh, industrial output, the growth of uh, value added per worker, something more than 70% during that period, yeah, and I think like a, a good example here is that, like how the regime dealt with the with the with the labor unions. Even though like the regime worked very hard on establishing these uh, sort of institutions where 
like workers can express their opinion or like ask for improvements and so on it at the same time it actually co-opted these institutions since the since the beginning so like like the workers theoretically had this sort of a space but it was completely co-opted and observed and surveilled uh, like um like like it was working within the larger regimes like strategy so it was not a space of uh, a space for actually organizing as much as it was a space for support yeah i think broadly the uh the thesis of the paper is don't throw the baby out with the bath water <laughs> A lot of uh, yes, some parts of that experiment were absolute failures. Some parts of that experiment were uh, abhorrent, but also some parts of that experience deserve to be recovered and deserve to be understood better. Exactly. And now let me introduce Akua Opokwa Britton, associate professor of gender and labor studies at the Institute for Development Studies, University of Cape Coast. As a researcher for post-colonialism today, she focuses on post-independence development planning in Ghana and Tanzania. Let me say striking uh, differences between development planning now and uh, development planning in the immediate af aftermath of um, independence is, is a commitment at nation building that would benefit everyone in the nation. The other is, is the coordinated attempt at nation building. But at, at, at the time at independence, the politics of it was really important. The clarity about who is a development actor, who should be the final beneficiary of development, and uh, who should control resources. There was no doubt about it. So the state was in control of everything, the ideas, the resources, its distribution, the role of market forces in distribution of the outcomes of uh, nation building was very good. But there was the ideological base, a certain level of social consciousness um, about development planning. So if we take a look at uh, Ghana and Tanzania, which were the two um, countries I compared, and um, I compared because then they, these were experiments that stand out even till now. People look back at them with nostalgia in terms of what uh, they really presented uh, for Africa. And, and the fact that whatever gains that were made are still fundamental to the, 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 um, they, they form the, the basis of, of whatever is holding the nations together currently. So if we take the, the case of, of Ghana, uh, for example, we, we, we talk about the distribution of nation building facilities, education, health facilities, and all that. And the attempt at bringing everybody together so that uh, uh, the seemingly political stabilities and the absence of ethnic, striking ethnic divisions that appear in other places that sometimes erupt in, in violence, uh, for example, that seems to be rather low in Ghana. And for Tanzania, it was the point about bringing everybody together and the need for a common language in Ghana was a point about spreading the benefits of nation building so that um, parts of the country that had been kept as labor send, sending reserves also could be brought in very quickly. The other point also was the understanding uh, that um, uh, you needed to have control, not only over the, the human resource that was required for nation building, but you also needed to have control over the, the, the generation of research. And so the institutions that were set up to do research, the institutions that were set up also to coordinate their research activities and all that. But what's most important was the fact that uh, these nations felt that they needed their own um, uh, plans 
and 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 set out to develop their plans and and uh, felt that they had control and they, they could do it and and therefore uh, should should do it so one big part of it is the africanization of a um, key planning sectors. It had to be Africans that were doing it, it had to be Ghanaians and all that. And then the, the point also that it wasn't just a, a national endeavor, it was also a continental endeavor. The fact that there should be ownership in terms of thoughts, there should be ownership in terms of resources, and there should also be ownership in terms of um, who is at the driving seat. Of, of this nation building efforts. So, so the feminist analysis of, of uh, post-independent policies are striking, were striking uh, for me uh, because, you know, um, one had always known that women play the leading role in the nationalist struggle. But then we've, we've said that uh, history really is his story. So you had the once in a while, a few women's name will come up in all this. By doing this work, the striking thing was the role women played and, uh, and the way in which different analytical tools that are submitted to examine the way the role women play uh, tends to then um, make them invisible. So um, taking a look from a feminist perspective, it becomes very clear uh, how women were critical to this. Uh, and, and finally, when uh, development uh, comes their way, they no longer are seen as the critical movers of nation building. So what do I mean by this? You find out that in both Ghana and Tanzania, they were really uh, women who were operating in the uh, as traders, there were women operating outside the confines of a formal economic setup, which is wage work, uh, professional work, and all that. And you find that um, it was easy for these women, uh, first of all, to be engaged in the nationalist struggle, because then we are told in Tanzania, for example, especially the the, the Former workers, the whole fear of losing their jobs, and, and they were, it was more easy to target them, uh, which was not the case for women in, in the in traders. It was not the case for traders because then they were not wage workers. So you find out that um, in, in the case of Tanzania, uh, BB uh, Titi, for example, when uh, she was uh, invited uh, to meet a group, uh, she was able to negotiate so that she, she could have more space within that group. You find also that in, in Ghana, these women understood also that um, moving the political uh, uh, space required a brow visits to the communities, even before the uh, party activities could take place, prior visits to the communities, uh, working out and mobilizing people. And the interesting thing also was a, was a choice of messages. So messages in terms of the songs they were able to, to compose as a mobilizing spot, but even the, the use of, of cloth also and the messages that this cloth carried and how then they, they became the basis for uh, mobilizing. So these uh, mobilization tools that these women adopted, really very striking. The disappointment really, which is still a lesson also, is, is how these, the very basis of nation building, mobilizing, and, and, and bringing uh, some visibility to the, um, to, to the exploitative nature, nature of colonial rule that was carried uh, uh, in the work of these women it was not um, 
mobilize for nation building, I must say. I think that, that that's lost opportunity because the nation building, which also was seen as modernization, immediately rid these women of their political power, of their clout and their ability to, to find an independent space and bring into that space uh, the, their own organizational skills. So in, in adopting the uh, feminist lens, even though women were an important development constituency, uh, women could only make a, a, um, a credible co uh, contribution to development if they have formal education. Mainly, uh, people who are looking for um, formal sector jobs. So formal sector job was seen as what will liberate women and women who did not, who did not have a background to benefit from formal sector jobs uh, could not uh, find their own feet. Uh, one uh, is also carried into our the, the, the narratives of uh, the whole um, story of our nation building so that these, these women uh, in terms of how they are celebrated, how they are accounted for. And in Ghana, when we are talking about founders of the nation we, and, and who, who spent time in, um, in jail, we hardly ever talk about uh, uh, women like 60-year-old um, uh, uh, Audua Ankara who suffered time in colonial prisons on account of her activism. A queer as a BAEC, and, and nobody is, is thinking about the, these women. Now, in terms of the striking things, um, I, I think that for me is, is one is the understanding of uh, the connection between uh, the national economy and the international economy. The second also. Is, is the vision of these two um, precedents that the, the successes within their countries is, is built on the connectivity within the continent. And, um, and that connectivity is, 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 is not what is carried right now into the African Union and that has given us the continental free trade agreement but that connectivity that that builds a self-sufficiency but then self-sufficiency in ways that uh, can rip dependence on uh, international political forces there was that clarity about uh, the need to have a national base the need to have control over national resources but what was missing in terms of carrying this clarity ahead is still the fallback on international political capital as a basis for developing their nations. And I think that this, is, this was almost like shooting themselves in their foot, you know, because Nkrumah was very clear and all that. And, 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 and the fact that there was the expectation that international foreign capital was going to sit and wait patiently and, and help them build their nation so that they can be independent of them. So the, the, these striking things, you know, is, is how there was so much political clarity with these early uh, uh, presidents. They knew what the problem was and what to do and how now uh, subsequent ones appear to believe that they, they can develop within their political, uh, current political economic framework and that uh, more borrowing uh, will do the job for them. And, and no questioning of, of the place of the countries, of the two countries, of the nations within the, and how we are connected into the international political era. And that's also, and one of the things I went into uh, this exercise was that, why did the Tanzanian experiment last so long? Why did it get buy-in from the West, Western nations? You know, because there was a lot of donor funding for it. And the, 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 the 
answer for me was the extent to which uh, capital felt threatened. And very clearly, Nkoma was a bigger threat than Tanzania, even though there were there are lessons, lessons to that. So that the transformative um, uh, potential of Ghana appeared to be higher than that, that in Tanzania, which was reformist. So two things, the clear political statement that these experiments carried, the absence of a feminist outlook, the, a, a critical feminist outlook, not just any feminist outlook, that could have uh, framed the way in which women were incorporated within the development uh, plans at that time in ways that could have um, uh, built on the mobilizing power of women and therefore built a stronger political base to own these processes. And, and, and then the, the, the comprehensiveness of the connectivity between all aspects of, of nation building, uh, agriculture connected to industrialization, research supposed to inform uh, in industrialization, and then industrialization's focus also was nation building and the worker as a carrying agent of, of, of this process. The carrying agent is also the beneficiary. That finally, the uh, inability to appreciate the, the strength of the very political forces that were trying to uh, win their nations of which uh, finally became the, the weakest point in the, the process and therefore made, it, made the process vulnerable to be undermined and finally uh, to be completely brought down. And now let me introduce Shafiq Ben Rubin, president and co-founder of the Tunisian Observatory of the Economy. As a researcher for post-colonialisms today, he focused on the developmental roles of the central bank in post-independence Tunisia. Bonjour, donc euh, aujourd'hui je vais présenter l'étude que, que j'ai écrite sur le rôle de, de la Banque centrale dans le cadre de la décolonisa décolonisa décolonisation euh, économique de la Tunisie à la sortie de son indépendance. Euh, donc l'idée c'est un peu de présenter les, les grands axes de, de cette étude. Donc le, le premier axe tourne autour de, euh, en quelque sorte, la description euh, des structures de domination économique qui étaient en vigueur à l'époque du pacte colonial instauré par la France en Tunisie. Donc il faut savoir que le, les structures de domination économique tournaient principalement autour de trois grandes structures. Euh, une structure monétaire autour de la zone franc de la Banque centrale d'Algérie et de Tunisie à l'époque. Euh, une structure bancaire notamment à travers le réseau de banques françaises d'assurer l'accumulation primitive de capital en Tunisie, et enfin une structure douanière de domination économique autour de l'union douanière qui permet d'un côté de faciliter la mise en valeur et la désaccumulation du capital à travers le rapatriement des capitaux donc dans sa forme disons de libre-échange, dans son côté libre-échange, et l'instauration d'un tarif commun extérieur qui est celui de la France afin de faire de la Tunisie un marché captif de la France et d'évincer toute concurrence autre. Donc pourquoi c'est important Pourquoi, pourquoi j'ai décrit un peu ces structures de, de, de domination économique Principalement parce que en ce qui concerne par exemple la structure monétaire et bancaire, celle-ci permet de faciliter, de soutenir, de garantir l'accumulation primitive des colons en Tunisie et elle permet aussi d'orienter les crédits selon cette approche et empêche donc tout développement d'une économie locale non inscrite dans le pacte colonial. En ce qui concerne la structure monétaire et douanière, elle permet premièrement de jouer le rôle de marché d'écoulement des produits français et elle permet également une accumulation primitive qui est ensuite rapatriée en métropole grâce à la libre circulation des capitaux. Ceci engendre bien entendu une impossibilité d'initier un quelconque processus d'accumulation autonome du capital pour la Tunisie. Donc il faut savoir que les accords de 1955, qui étaient un peu soi-disant les accords d'autonomie pour la Tunisie, ont en quelque sorte garder les mêmes rapports de domination sous une autre forme qu'on a appelée par la suite coopération ou assistance technique. Dans une deuxième partie de, du papier, on s'est focalisé principalement sur le processus de décolonisation économique en Tunisie. 
Donc le processus de décolonisation économique, il a commencé, on va dire, en pratique, euh, avec l'instauration, l'idée de l'instauration d'une banque centrale et d'une monnaie nationale. Cette idée, elle avait été développée par l'UGTT, l'UGTT de Ben Salah, dès 1956, et dans le cadre, bien entendu, du contexte idéologique de l'époque autour euh, du bourguibisme, qui, dont sa particularité, est euh, de promouvoir une décolonisation par étapes. Donc cette décolonisation par étapes, euh, en ce qui concerne la décolonisation économique, elle s'est faite à deux grandes étapes. La première, c'est la dévaluation du franc français. Donc il faut savoir que le dinar tunisien était directement lié, euh, rattaché au franc français. Et le fait que Bourguiba n'a pas suivi euh, cette dévaluation, ce qui a engendré un décrochage du dinar tunisien et automatiquement euh, la mise en place d'un transfert des capitaux. J'insiste sur ce point parce que même, par exemple, quelqu'un comme Samir Amin doutait fortement de la capacité des pays en voie de développement de, de mettre en place un contrôle des capitaux. En Tunisie, ça a été fait très rapidement. Dès que le dinar a décroché, pas plus d'un mois après, il y a eu un, un mis en place un, 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 un transfert, de, un, un, un contrôle des capitaux qui a permis de réduire justement les risques de fuite des capitaux. Le deuxième tournant euh, réellement de la décolonisation, ça a été bien entendu la guerre d'Algérie. Donc, la France a fait payer le soutien euh, de, de la Tunisie à la guerre d'Algérie, et notamment à l'Algérie dans le cadre de la guerre d'Algérie, par la suppression de l'aide financière de la France. Et donc, en contrepartie, la Tunisie qui estimait qu'en contrepartie de, 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 de cette aide financière, euh, il y avait la structure de douanière, de, si vous voulez, de contrôle de domination économique qui devait être aussi renégociée. Et donc, elle a utilisé la suppression de l'aide financière de la France du fait du soutien de la Tunisie à l'Algérie pour sortir unilatéralement de l'Union douanière. Et donc, il faut savoir du coup que c'est en quelque sorte des événements extérieurs, que ce soit la dévaluation du franc français ou bien la guerre d'Algérie, qui ont été utilisés à bon escient par euh, l'élite, en quelque sorte, et le gouvernement euh, tunisien pour sortir des structures de domination, que ce soit le contrôle des capitaux ou bien l'Union douanière. Seul le contrôle sur les réserves de change n'a pas été totalement décolonisé et jusqu'à aujourd'hui, à travers la loi 72, la Tunisie n'a pas un contrôle total sur ses réserves de change. Donc tout ça, ça s'inscrit bien entendu dans le cadre de l'influence de la France en plus, c'est-à-dire notamment dans le cadre de la, de la période post-décolonisation, post savoir que par exemple les, les, les hauts cadres de la banque centrale, la nouvelle banque centrale qui a été, qui a été formée avait été en quelque sorte envoyée à la Banque de France pour être formée, le cas par exemple de Mansour Moala, de Nouira, qui était un ancien de, de, de l'inspection de des finances françaises. Bref, l'influence culturelle de la France était toujours présente dans, dans, dans le cadre de la décolonisation, de post-décolonisation. Et enfin, on a essayé de tourner un peu sur les, la question de la définition de la monnaie, sur quoi elle repose, et ça je vous laisserai l'occasion de regarder ça dans le papier directement. Donc pourquoi c'est important de, de, de rentrer dans tous ces détails Premièrement, parce que la situation dans laquelle était la Tunisie était exactement la même situation que celle du franc CFA actuel, donc c'est quelque chose qui est toujours d'actualité, une situation qui peut être en quelque sorte regardée par les pays qui sont dans le cadre du franc CFA, et elle permet en quelque sorte de donner un exemple de sortie réussie de la zone franc CFA, contrairement aux différents, si vous voulez, exemples d'échecs qui ont eu lieu dans la période post-décoloniale, que ce soit Sécoutouré en Guinée, Modibo Keïta au Mali, Sylvanus Olympo au Tango, ou bien Thomas Sankara au Burkina Faso. Il y a aussi l'importance d'une politique cohérente, donc par exemple la fin de la parité entre, entre le franc français et le dinar tunisien a tout de suite entraîné euh, auprès euh, des autorités tunisiennes la nécessité d'instaurer un contrôle des capitaux pour empêcher une fuite des capitaux qui aurait pu être fatale pour, euh, pour le, le pays. Enfin, la spécificité du contexte régional tunisien qui est importante, c'est-à-dire que, par exemple, la France menaçait les pays de la zone France CFA d'arrêter l'aide financière s'ils voulaient sortir de la zone, alors que dans le cadre de la Tunisie, c'est l'inverse. C'est la France qui a directement arrêté cette aide, non pas s'ils voulaient sortir de la zone franc, mais plutôt en soutien, euh, en, dans le cadre du soutien de la Tunisie à la guerre, guerre d'Algérie, ce qui a permis à la Tunisie de donner une opportunité à la Tunisie de sortir et de quitter l'Union douanière. Enfin, le troisième chose qui est important, c'est le rôle politique fort du syndicat tunisien du GTT qui a joué un rôle central dans le cadre de la décolonisation économique. Donc ça, c'est quand même important à garder en tête, étant donné qu'on le voit aujourd'hui, euh, il y a une forte remise en cause du franc CFA avec des mobilisations populaires dans toute l'Afrique francophone, principalement en Afrique de l'Ouest. Et donc, il y a un momentum un peu à garder 
et c'est un peu important, si vous voulez, de, 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 de mettre de la lumière sur, en quelque sorte, une success story de décolonisation monétaire. Et donc, si ça peut inspirer euh, nos, nos, nos collègues, nos amis, euh, dans, en Afrique de l'Ouest, de, de sortir rapidement de la Fran du franc CFA, qui reste une structure de domination actuelle, euh, qui maintient euh, les pays euh, de la zone franc CFA sous la domination française. Le tro la troisième partie du, du papier, c'est principalement le rôle euh, de la Banque centrale dans l'expérience socialiste de Ben Salah. Il faut savoir qu'à l'époque, la plus grande réforme qui était mise en, pla mise en place, c'était la réforme agraire. Donc suite à la reprise en main du contrôle par la Banque centrale de l'économie tunisienne, il fallait, il fallait lever les contraintes internes à l'accumulation du capital qui étaient principalement des inégalités trop fortes dans l'agriculture qui ne permettaient pas de créer une demande assez large pour s'industrialiser. Donc c'est un peu une approche hétérodoxe de l'accumulation du capital. Euh, autre chose aussi qui est important à garder en tête, c'est qu'à l'époque, l'élite était en quelque sorte sevrée de, 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 de culture occidentale du développement et donc, si vous voulez, l'idée, c'était que la Tunisie devait rattraper le retard et que l'élite devait éclairer le peuple, en quelque sorte arriéré. Et donc, euh, dans le cadre de la réforme agraire, ça, ça s'est transformé en quelque sorte euh, par une approche qui euh, mettait en, en exergue un besoin en équipement et notamment en importation de capitaux qui était extrêmement élevé. Et donc, ça, ça a créé une, comment dire, une dépendance aux bailleurs de fonds qui était extrêmement forte. Donc pour pallier un peu au manque d'épargne, la Banque centrale elle a eu quand même des politiques assez fortes. Euh, elle a obligé, elle a forcé en quelque sorte les banques commerciales à souscrire jusqu'à 25% de leurs dépôts, soit en bons du trésor, soit en bons d'équipement, afin de financer l'effort de développement économique et social du pays. Donc ça c'est quand même quelque chose d'assez fort. Et ça a permis en quelque sorte de mobiliser les ressources bancaires pour financer la réforme agraire. Euh, par exemple, la campagne de mobilisation d'épargne qui a été aussi mise en place, elle a permis de faire passer l'épargne de 4 millions de dinars en 61 à 29 millions de dinars en 68. Et enfin, le taux de réescompte qui a été en quelque sorte euh, non pas unique mais différencié selon les objectifs stratégiques. Par exemple, euh, il y avait un taux de réescompte qu'on appelle aujourd'hui taux, taux directeur qui était spécifique pour l'équilibre de la balance des paiements, pour les crédits à l'exportation un taux spécifique pour l'industrialisation du pays, les crédits d'équipement à moyen, à moyen terme notamment, et enfin un taux spécifique aussi pour le développement de l'infrastructure agricole, euh, etc. Donc pourquoi, pourquoi cette description est importante Premièrement parce qu'elle montre une approche hétérodoxe de l'accumulation du capital, qui tourne autour de la réduction des inégalités afin d'augmenter le pouvoir d'achat réel de la majorité de la population et de créer une demande solvable permettant l'accumulation de capital et l'industrialisation. En quelque sorte, le crédit et la politique de crédit sert à remplacer temporairement la déficience structurelle euh, inégalitaire, mais ce n'est pas une solution de long terme car elle, elle, elle sert aussi à masquer les inégalités euh, lorsqu'elles existent. L'autre chose qui est si importante, c'est l'intervention directe de la Banque centrale à la fois sur l'épargne, sur la mobilisation des ressources bancaires afin de financer le développement et non pas pour financer des importations pour la plupart superflues comme c'est le cas aujourd'hui. Et enfin, le taux directeur différencié, ça remplace aujourd'hui euh, le taux directeur unique et c'est une idée qui, sur laquelle on peut s'inspirer encore. Euh, en ce qui concerne la réforme agraire, euh, un des points importants à souligner, c'est que celle-ci a échoué au bout de 9 ans, 10 ans, et c'est important de tirer les leçons pour lesquelles cette, cette réforme a échoué. Premièrement, sur le plan culturel, il y avait en quelque sorte à l'époque une trop forte euh, admiration envers le modèle occidental et pas assez de capitalisation sur le savoir local en termes agricoles, sachant que celle-ci existait réellement, comme on l'a mis un peu dans le papier, il y a un peu quelques, quelques notions sur ce point-là, et donc ça, ça a engendré une trop forte dépendance à l'importation d'équipements étrangers, parfois non adapté euh, au système en Tunisie, et donc une dépendance aussi à la mobilisation de ressources extérieures et donc aux bailleurs de fonds. Et donc l'imposition à la fois, cette dépendance à la bailleur de fonds, elle a créé une imposition d'une logique financière court terme, avant une logique sociale de long terme. Sur le plan géopolitique, quelque chose qui est assez intéressant, c'est que la réforme agraire s'est faite avec l'appui américain à travers le FMI et la Banque mondiale, et en quelque sorte, euh, dès que cette réforme agraire est devenue sérieuse, en gros, dès qu'il y a eu euh, la généralisation de la réforme agraire en 1969, Ben Salah a été lâché de toutes parts. Enfin, sur le plan administratif, il y a eu en quelque sorte un, une, une, des pro, une des grandes problématiques de la, de la réforme agraire, ça a été, il, a été, il y a eu une reproduction en quelque sorte de la centralisation de l'administration, 
et d'une approche un peu coloniale envers les paysans euh, en pratique qui, en quelque sorte, étaient là pour leur dire ce qu'il fallait faire et n'ont pas pris en considération les pratiques en cours. Enfin, sur le plan de la mobilisation des ressources domestiques, la Banque centrale elle a atteint son objectif d'investissement financé par au moins 50% de mobilisation des ressources domestiques, qui était dans le cadre du plan décennal. Mais comme on l'a vu, cela n'a pas été suffisant car les besoins étaient trop élevés, notamment du fait que tout dépendait de l'importation d'équipements étrangers. Donc ça, ça montre qu'une intervention plus décisive de la Banque centrale dans la, dans la mobilisation des ressources domestiques en mettant en place des objectifs, par exemple une obligation de collatéral sur des bons du trésor ou d'équipements pour les banques qui veulent se refinancer auprès d'elles, peut être un outil intéressant aujourd'hui pour commencer à financer les besoins en équipement et en infrastructure du pays. L'importance de la mobilisation du capital de savoir euh, autochtone euh, est importante afin de réduire aussi au maximum les besoins en capitaux extérieurs, on n'y pense souvent pas, mais c'est quelque chose d'extrêmement important afin de réduire les besoins en capital. Et enfin, une approche plus démocratique dans la conception et la mise en œuvre des réformes, notamment la réforme agraire ou la réforme agricole ou toute autre réforme, qui permettent de prendre en considération la vision des acteurs du terrain et non pas d'avoir une approche uniquement top-down technocratique. Donc voilà un peu, si vous voulez, les, les leçons de, 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 cette, de, de cette étude et je vous invite à, à, à y jeter un coup d'œil pour avoir plus de détails. Merci. And now let me introduce Sarah Salem, Assistant Professor in the Sociology Department at the London School of Economics and Political Science. As a researcher for post-colonialism today, she focuses on radical regionalism and feminism in the post-independence period. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sara Salem and I am recording this video to basically give a really general layout of the article that I wrote for the Post-Colonialism Today project. And the article is entitled Radical Regionalism. Feminism, Sovereignty, and the Pan-African Project. So in this video, I'm going to kind of give an overview of the article as a whole, some of the questions that I wanted to ask, and also kind of go through each section and bring out kind of the main questions and main debates that I was uh, interested in tackling. So the paper as a whole is really interested in the moment of decolonization across Africa, a moment that brought about historic changes. Um, in many ways, we have learned about this moment largely through what it maybe didn't bring about, but importantly, it was also a moment of optimism, of solidarity, and of a radical rethinking of political and economic systems. So the article explores how different nations across the continent articulated new projects of economic development and political sovereignty that demonstrated a clear awareness of the structural limits that were imposed by colonial rule. And these structural limits very much continued after decolonization. Through both ideological and material changes, many of these nations tried to resist colonial structures of global capital and create a more equal post-colonial world. Through nationalization, industrialization, um, social welfare, and many other kind of economic interventions, states tried to create new forms of independent development that relied on regional cooperation with social policies such as free education, free healthcare, and guaranteed employment being introduced to strengthen and modernize the nation. This is in contrast to how regionalism across the African continent is envisioned today, which is often within a neoliberal framework that operates at the state level and prioritizes free trade, access to foreign capital and foreign direct invest investment, and producing citizens as competitive workers in the global world market. I use the term regionalism throughout the article to think to talk about a policy of continentalism across Africa. And the reason that I term it regionalism is to, is to echo the third worldist belief in various de decolonized regions coming together to confront colonial capitalism. Regionalism therefore speaks both to a form of continental solidarity across Africa, as well as a belief in Africa as a region coming together in solidarity with other regions such as Latin America and Asia. Because of this, I argue that there's no clear division or difference between regionalism, internationalism, and nationalism. In many ways, these different um, ways of connecting feed into each other throughout this moment of decolonization. Now, regional solidarity and cooperation was 
obviously clearly linked as well to the evolving project of Pan-Africanism, which connected African countries on the basis of a shared ideological project of independence and anti-colonialism. Ideas of sovereignty and internationalism in particular, I think have so much to tell us about this broader project of Pan-Africanism. And I think in many ways, we remember this moment of decolonization through this, uh, the lens of national independence, but actually many of these projects understood national independence to be inextricable from regional, from continental and from global um, economic, political and social independence. So the overarching aim of the article was to trace how regionalism comes up during this historical moment. How can we kind of see where it becomes an important um, influence? How can we situate policies and debates within this idea of regional connections? And also, how can we think about decolonization as something that can tell us about solidarity and connection, as well as obviously the the kind of broader changes that were happening at this time. And so my main research question in the article was how did post-colonial African states assert their sovereignty by reimagining regionalism and the international through the Pan-African project and what lessons can be learned for the, for the contemporary period? Now in the article, I look at two particular aspects of the Pan-African life world. The first is the underlying regionalism that runs through it, which I refer to as radical regionalism. And the second is the contributions that were made to this project by African feminists and feminist organizations who engaged with each other um, constantly throughout the 20th century and were really influential in how we conceptualize agency and sovereignty. Um, and of course, we're really influential in constantly incorporating gender and gender equality into debates around African independence. And thinking through these two different areas together, I think provides a really important entry point into both the promises, but also the challenges of decolonization from this perspective of um, connections and solidarities. Um, throughout the article, I use many form, multiple forms of data, um, including primary archival material and secondary sources. Some of the archives and the archival material is taken from the Wilson archives on the Bandung Conference, the Women's International Alliance archives at the LSE Library, and the archives of the Pan-African Congress in Manchester. Um, and uh, just a quick note, because in some ways there are parts of the Pan-African project that have been archived and documented much more extensively than others. And one challenge that I did face through the research process was the lack of material on feminists who were active during this period, specifically a systematic collection um, of what they thought, what they said, and what they did. And this pushed me to kind of think a bit more about what it means to archive radical moments as well. So these moments of de decolonization um, are, are already in and of themselves not archived as much as kind of the colonial period, for instance. But even within this radical archive work on feminists or other kind of um, historically marginalized groups is even less available. And I just wanted to kind of point that out because it does mean that um, certain forms of analysis rely less on archival material than other forms. So the article itself begins uh, by looking at this idea of the colonial international. And this is an idea I take from the scholar Vivian Jabri. Um, and I, it, it tries to kind of put forward this idea that nations across the global South saw sovereignty as central to independence and as a key way of challenging what Jabri calls um, the colonial international, in other words, a global sphere that continued to reproduce colonialism even at, after the end of empire. And I'm going to start now by just briefly bringing out some of the key points that I make in this section. So sovereignty during the anti-colonial and post-colonial period was very much connected to Africa's relationship with the international sphere, one that was still structured by colonialism. And this becomes clear when we look at initiative, initiatives such as the Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung, a conference that brought together for the first time the leaders of newly independent nations in order to kind of create a world after empire. And I think 
in this section of the article, I pay special attention to what was meant by sovereignty. What were states kind of discussing when they discussed sovereignty? And in particular, what were the material, material or economic dimensions of sovereignty? So sovereignty was never understood simply as a legal framework, but also as a framework of economic independence. Now, Vivian Chabri, as I said, coined this term colonial international to describe an international sphere still permeated by colonialism in the 1950s and 1960s. And this, I think, uh, this concept has clear parallels with Kwame Nkrumah's idea of neocolonialism, for instance. Now, in both of these scholars' um, work, we see a definition of sovereignty as something that was seen as belonging to some nations and not others, right? So as Anthony Angie has argued, sovereignty existed in kind of this linear continuum. Uh, so nations that were seen as closer to this ideal of the European nation state were seen as sovereign, whereas other nations were seen as yet to become sovereign. And so for many of the post-colonial states, um, especially and, and not least in Africa, we see that sovereignty became a key site of uh, contestation as they attempted to redefine what it meant to actually be a sovereign nation. And here I argue that actually it was regaining control over institutions of economics that were very central to how they envisioned independence and um, the possibility of sovereignty. So it was not just a call for an ideological or a legal shift in what sovereignty meant and who could access it, but the call for sovereignty was also um, related to calls for industrialization, for the introduction of economic policies that encouraged cooperation within the global south, um, calls to create and share technical expertise, research and development, and calls to establish international bodies that could co coordinate economic development. Above all, I think all of this speaks to this idea that many African nations were calling for self-determination in terms of economic policy because they saw this as a really central dimension of what it meant to be a sovereign nation. Now, the next section of the article kind of continues this debate, but thinks a bit more explicitly about the idea of internationalism, regionalism, solidarity, and so on, and how this also was kind of something that emerges very clearly in these debates around sovereignty. Now, ideas of internationalism animated many of the movements, as we know, that were active during the period of decolonization, showing that these lines between the national and international were often blurred um, in these attempts to transform the world. Uh, Pan-Africanism, for instance, called for the economic, political, social, and intellectual cooperation of African countries and the African diaspora. And its main call was that African resources be used for the development of African peoples and that independence meant more than legal or political emancipation. So I think here in this section, I kind of show how the period of decolonization produced an interesting articulation of sovereignty that blurred the lines between the national and international, producing this idea of radical regionalism. And the section is largely built around an analysis of both the 1945 Pan-African Conference in Manchester and the 1955 um, a conference at Bandung. So, I kind of think about how we can use archival material from both of these conferences to sketch out the specificities of radical regionalism and sovereignty um, at this time. The next section turns to the question of feminism. And here I was especially interested in thinking with this idea of transnational feminism to explore some of the connections and solidarities that emerged between African feminists and feminists in Latin America and Asia and the Middle East to think of what a feminist approach to decolonization and radical regionalism looked like. So here I focus on um, a few different conferences and spaces to kind of sketch out what debates feminists were having. And I think what was really notable here was that these debates kind of showed 
that feminists often made a double critique towards both imperialism and colonialism and capitalism, but also to the emerging nation states, um, these emerging post-colonial nation states that they saw as not always living up to the radical politics that they professed. And so here I think we have so much to learn about how feminist articulations of decolonization were often much more incisive and radical than kind of the ones we see when we look at more male dominated spaces. And I think um, for many of these feminists, decolonization was never simply about men from these different countries taking over political power. It was about liberation for both men and women, but also liberation in a much more full sense. And so to conclude now, um, I'm going to just kind of talk a little bit about the final section where I try to think about how our current context that of course is very different, both economically where we've seen the increasing embeddedness of neoliberalism, politically where we've seen again, increasing authoritarianism and the shutting down of actual, actual space for political contestation in many countries. And also globally where we've seen, especially after COVID increasing um, and intensifying global inequality. And what I ask in this final section is, are there particular lessons that we can learn in this contemporary moment from the past? Are there um, lessons about what sovereignty means, what economic policies look like, what political contestation look like? And also are there lessons that we as feminists today can learn from the anti-colonial period? And so the final section is really interested in how this past moment speaks to the present and why it's important for us to always center decolonization and anti-colonialism in our reflections of the world today. So I hope this was a good summary of this article. Please do read it if you're interested. And um, it was very nice to be able to share it with all of you and to be part of this um, incredible project. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today for part one of our publication launch event. We would love to see you again next week on March 10th for our live reading group, which will feature three parallel conversations amongst the authors of the publication and you all. The first group will discuss development planning and financing. The second will delve into industrialization and economic transformation. And the third group will interrogate the ideological and epistemological questions, including ones related to African feminism and pan-Africanisms. If you have registered for today's event, then we will send you the details for part two via email. If you haven't already signed up, please register for the continuation of our discussion on March 10th. You will see the, the link on the screen right now, and we will be sharing it in the chat. Thank you again so much for being part of our community and we hope to see you all next week. Goodbye.